Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, this conversation, the topic is a technical discussion through two case studies. The first being the Booz Allen breach, which was, I would say, one of the simpler um, mistakes to make when you're deploying your environment to the cloud. And then we're going to move to a, a much more complex one, which was the Capital One case study. So let's jump into introduction. So we'll start with with you, Alex. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, Alex Korsdorfen, uh, lead security solutions engineer, um, uh, now by Rapid7, but I've been with Divi Cloud for about two years now. Chris? Hey, uh, my name is Chris Doremus, uh, VP of technology here at Rapid7, and it's great, great to be here today. Really excited to talk about this uh, topic. My role here at Rapid7 as VP of tech technology for the cloud security practice is to work and coordinate with our product support and engineering teams to really continue to deliver and drive in innovation in the cloud security posture management space, but um, also as well as collaborating cross practice with a lot of our other leaders at Rapid7 to work on building a holistic view of governance, risk and compliance for all of our customers. And this is a really exciting topic today and anxious to look, um, to look ahead and answer the questions that you have in the audience. So thank you. Yeah, thanks guys. And um, I'm also at Rapid7. I run our advisory and offensive security practices. So let's jump in. Uh, the first question before we get into the case studies, and this is one when I was kind of building this topic is really, uh, it's one of the things I struggle with a little bit is why does the cloud environment increase the complexity in protecting the attack surface as well as overall responding to an event once it's happened? And so Chris, let's start with start with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like we could actually spend almost the entire talk just on this this one topic. I mean, really, I think it boils down to, you know, five or six points. One, I think that the the democratization of cloud is is resulting with far few or sorry, far more stakeholders that have access to these environments and workloads. And so as you're seeing more and more stakeholders get into deploying workloads, reconfiguring workloads, maturing workloads, the rate of change is just going up exponentially. Um, with that rate of change and the ephemeral nature of the cloud that you see today, you're not seeing the hundreds or thousands of changes you might have seen in the data center you know, times. You're seeing millions and in some cases, maybe hundreds of millions of changes go through every single month. Um, you know, you've got dynamic auto scaling. You've got, you know, a lot of other you know, capabilities where these, these applications are not static. They're very, very fluid and they're very dynamic and how and uh, where people get access to them can can change at a moment's notice. You also will see that innovations in the cloud result in re-architecture and configuration changes in how people leverage the cloud for their workloads. You know, we got reInvent coming up here, I think next week, and we'll see, you know, a dozen or maybe more new, new services. People often want to use those new innovations as more affordable ways to run their products and their and, and, and their services. And with that reconfiguration, potentially gives you brand new attack vectors and um, you know surface area you have to be be, be mindful of. Um, and then you know one one of the last points here at you know Divi Cloud and you know now now Rapid Seven is you've got you know a multi cloud construct to think about. You know so even if you go in and you're thinking like I'm I'm only AWS or I'm 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 only Azure you're going to go maybe acquire a company that has a new hot product or hot technology that you want to integrate into your portfolio. They might run on a completely foreign cloud provider that you're not used to. So, you know, complexities also come with, you know, every single cloud service provider has a different way to do cloud security within it. And you're having to always keep pace with those new attack vectors. Yeah. You know, I think that's I think, a really good point. Sorry. <laughs> I think with that, the, the additional complexity, I, I think just even looking at those last two pictures, the first one had, you know, kind of that very simple legacy, like network, we've got the, the border, networking is my world and that's all I care about. Now we've got networking on the cloud side of things, which is still, you know, still a challenge and, you know, even more complex in all the different kind of elastic ways that things can be configured. But now in, in addition, You've got things beyond networking that still define access that we need to deal with. You know, back in the day, I set up my NetApp on the right subnets and I have all those, um, you know, all those firewall rules set up right. You can probably call it good. We're going to talk a lot about storage today and how, you know, there's not a lot of network configurations by themselves that have really led to these breaches. And so, um, you know, everything is harder and, and there's almost more, more layers that we need to deal with now to really make sure that everything is, is locked down and secure. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, if, if you had to kind of summarize the maybe the, the biggest thing or the most important thing that an organization could do is they're thinking about their cloud security and how this complexity should shift and change their priorities. What would those priority shifts look like? We're moving to the cloud. We need to address our priorities. What are some of the you know, kind of first things that come? It's to a mind? great question. I mean, I think I think micro segmentation. You know, not not putting all your eggs in one one basket. Taking advantage of you know multi account, multi VPC. You know, really breaking these applications to be um, you know isolated. So in the event that there is a breach, it is you know contained. Um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of folks when they first begin their cloud journey, there, there's a big lift and shift initiative, and they want to get to the cloud as quickly as possible to realize the all of the benefits of the cloud bring brings with it the elasticity the cost savings um you know all all the like velocity gains but they don't think from a design perspective how can i design my apps and my workloads to be as contained as possible so thinking about that and thinking about identity access management which i think has been a theme you've heard probably throughout this summit is also important as well okay well um Alex, if you don't have anything to add to that question, I'll go ahead and jump. I'd say one last one is plan. If we just lift and shift and we try to do the exact same thing somewhere else, we're either not going to get the upside that we wanted or we're going to end up uh, end up with things in kind of a worse state because these are not the same worlds. So, you know, it's harder and everyone wants to go to the cloud and, and timelines are always tight, but it's so much harder to change the wheels on a moving car. So plan first. That's a really good point. All right, well, let's jump into uh, the first case study, which is the, the Booz Allen breach from 2017. So what's interesting to me about this one is this is one of the simpler mistakes to make. And this the, the, the mistake that happened wasn't discovered for a really long time, which I think is, is, is compelling from a case study standpoint. So Alex, do you mind walking us through kind of what happened, what we could have done different? What yeah, we it, um, it's so funny because it, I think Calling it, you know, basic a basic breach is is really kind of the best way to do it because, you know, at the end of the day, what went wrong as far as you know how the data was leaked was a very small thing that was done that ended up with massive uh, repercussions. So uh, essentially, they they did the same thing that we've been seeing you know company after company do for the last three plus years, and that they had an open S three bucket. And I think it's kind of interesting because to people kind of not in the technology world, they see this and they go, oh, there was another hack. It wasn't a hack. It, someone left the front door open and they walked in because this was sitting and, and it was public. You know, in this particular case, it was worse because Booz Allen does, you know, uh, very sensitive government work. And so the type of data that was leaked um, was bad as far as the records. But then in addition, they also had SSH keys. And so when people got access to the bucket, then they also got access to instances which then led to more data uh, you know being leaked in another service i think you know one of the interesting things about this is is that okay we've seen this over the last couple of years and it keeps on coming up and everyone talks about it whether or not they're actually doing it right and and i think even you know when you look at you know like uh, amazon in particular when they they see these big kind of like egregious breaches pop up, they start to roll out new mechanisms to help kind of the masses get better at this. You know, this first started with them showing the little circle that says, hey, this bucket is public and it's, you know, bright and it's orange and, and theoretically that helps. Now they're, they've gotten even better where we can do blocks at the account level to say, hey, nothing can be exposed. Yet, even though they've rolled in all of these new capabilities and people are, are well aware of, of how this keeps on happening, people still keep on getting popped. And so I think that really highlights a lot of those complexities and just the challenge that the scale um, you know, of these different cloud environments brings, because even if you know what you should not be doing, we're still seeing a pop up. Yeah, fantastic points, Alex. So uh, I, 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 I completely agree. And you know, I, um, I, I find it very, very interesting how much the cloud providers are now shifting to object storage as as a whole and trying very very hard to to have mechanisms to help these these customers and you know kudos to them i mean i think that you've seen things like s3 access points you've seen you know the block bucket the, the block public access bucket and acl and policy settings come come through but 
interesting enough, even with all of those, you still see people doing it. And I think part of it just comes to S3 is a really convenient way to share stuff. I mean, people do it a lot. You just throw it up there. You give someone a link to grab a file. You know, we, we actually do it here, here, here at Divi Cloud. We actually have a public bucket that's meant for things just like this, not for sensitive information, at least. Right. And so when when you start to use those public facing buckets that might be meant for data that's not sensitive and you're not keeping tabs on what's going into them, um, it becomes very easy to lose sight of now a sensitive backup or sensitive customer info. It's just one file that goes in the bucket on top of maybe millions or in some cases, billions of objects that are that are there. So auditing this is really hard. I think it's going to be interesting to see how the clouds continue to mature their security offerings. We've seen, you know, Amazon go and have and have Macy come through with a with an update just this past year, which looks looks promising, but it is very very costly. Uh, they just had an S3 announcement come through yesterday, which 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 helps here too. So, you know, I think clouds still have some work to do, but they have made made strides. And I think the last thing I'll say on this is detecting public access for a bucket can be problematic too. I mean, there's five, six different ways to do it. And if you look at IM, all with all these different conditionals and ways that you can get into these bad spots, it's, you know, through no fault of your own, you're just applying a bucket policy, but based on the conditions that you put in, you're kind of tripping over your own, own, own feet. So leveraging things like Amazon's Zelkova service to, again, surface those those public permissions is, is, is very important and reviewing them frequently has, has to be done. Hey Chris, what was that service? Yeah, so Zel Zelkova is um, it, it, it's been built on the back end at Amazon. It's not a dedicated service, but it's effectively their engine that they use to power things like S3 for public access. The access analyzer that came out at reInvent last year is built on on top of Zelkova. So they're they're going to be using Zel Zelkova to continue to to drive it for the attendees in the in the audience. I highly recommend. Uh, there's a there's a couple white papers on it. It's actually a fascinating read. Very, very technical, but it shows the the, the um, amount of effort required to truly analyze IM to effectively identify public access. Um, what about non-Amazon? What about Google and Microsoft? What do they have a? a yeah, I mean, I think that, that there's um, there's fewer knobs inside of Azure and Google, so I, I'm 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 not aware of services per se that are just like Zelkova that power it, but I mean, I definitely know that. You've seen by getting their second, there's a lot of these security knobs that just can't be toggled on the on the object storage side. You can make Azure blobs public. You can make you know Google storage buckets buckets public. Uh, we definitely know it's possible. For one reason or another, we're not seeing as many breaches on the other cloud service providers. So I think it's just a more common thing to see this with with S3 because people have been using it for so long. I think it was Amazon's first service. That, that that came out there in uh, like 2008 or nine. All right, I was gonna wait to do Q&A to the end, but we have one come across that says, um, when will Divi Cloud be able to support new AWS firewalls? <laughs> so, yeah, so that just came out this week. Um, kudos on kind of keeping tabs on that. We, uh, we, we did just uh, add support for the Azure firewall service, which is very, very similar. Um, and like three, three days after we put the PR up for that, this new Amazon counterpart got announced. So we are looking at prioritizing it. I don't have an ETA yet, but we certainly know that it's going to be a very important resource that people want to get visibility into, and we will be prioritizing it accordingly. Great. All right. Uh, anything else to add to the Booz Allen case, guys, before I jump to Cap One? Okay. All right. So, so Capital One is, I would say, uh, quite a bit more complex. The attack scenario is a lot different. I think the impact is also a lot different, potentially more widespread. Mm -hmm. So Chris, walk us through this one, please. And again, similar to the last one, jump into what happened, what could have maybe they have yeah. done differently and what can we do? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is this is a fascinating um, you know, case study and there's there's loads of you know, write-ups on this. I definitely implore the audience to go to, to go read up on this one. I think, you know, this one's interesting for a few reasons. One, you know, I, I think it starts with a former Amazon employee who had some detailed knowledge of kind of Amazon and kind of the inner workings, not saying that that's, that this breach is Amazon's fault per se, but with this party having sort of that knowledge, it definitely helped. Really what this one came, came down to was Capital One leveraged a web application firewall um, that had a, based on the version that it was, there was a mod security vulnerability within the WAF that they were using. This malicious actor effectively took advantage of that exploit 
And, um, you know, I see a question where I have to get it in a minute. Um, they, they took advantage of that exploit and um, did a SSRF server side um, request forgery through the WAF to get access to Amazon's instance metadata service, IMDS. Now, for those that aren't aware of what that is, it's a service that is used um, for EC2 instances and ECS clusters and a few other services to get access to not only information about the asset that you're running on, but you can use it to do assume role operations and get credentials. And those, those credentials are, you know, your API key, your secret and your session token. Uh, assume role is a very common way that a lot of customers of, you know, various vendors allow access to their, their cloud accounts because you get temporary credentials. Now, the role that you assume is going to have different levels of permissions based on the instance profile that's associated with that EC2 instance. Um, this particular role, I, I, I'm not familiar with the application that Capital One was using, but whether they need this permission or not is unknown. The role itself did have the ability to iterate the S3 buckets, which is a S3 list all my buckets result. And then they had the ability to do S3 get object. So S3 get object is always one of the more scarier permissions out there. It's one thing to read the bucket, but if you can get the contents of the bucket, that is a, of a bigger concern. Uh, anyways, the contents were definitely iterated. They were able to pull out, um, you know, sensitive in, in information, and that did result in a lot of, you know, bad publicity, a lot of, con you know, concern by Capital One customers as well as financial penalties. I did see someone in the chat said that the eighty, the eighty million dollar penalty is peanuts for Capital One. I think you're entirely correct. Um, obviously, there was a hit to the reputation of them, of, of them, but yes, definitely peanuts. They probably make that in a single day. But this does show like not all companies are Capital One. Not all companies have that kind of revenue. And so the, the impact of breaches like this not only can result in uh, loss of faith and trust in your customers, but it can have financial penalties that can really, really hurt. I think what's really interesting about this one for me is what you saw after the breach. So you've seen some defense in, in depth enhancements by AWS going back to that instance metadata service. They have a V2 capability that's now available. Um, if you're doing a Zoom role in any of your Amazon accounts, highly encourage that you should take advantage of IMDS V2. It substantially mitigates, if not eliminates this type of SSRF vulnerability from, from occurring. Um, but Amazon is not forcing you to use that. So you can continue to use V1 they do have metrics that you can look at via CloudWatch that will let you know if you are using V1 or or not. Um, and I think that like, you know, look, overall this, this one's hard, right? I mean, you think about how much IAM roles are used in clouds today, you know, Capital One was trying to adhere to best best practices, right? They're using, they're using roles, they're assuming temporary credentials, but if you're not auditing the permissions that those roles have relative to what your application needs, you can get tripped up on this. And so I think one of the lessons learned from this is when you're when you see roles get attached to instances, look at the permission sets applied to those roles. You know, do routine audits. I know I know it's a lot to ask, but you know, work with your developers to figure out what are the permissions that they need, the least amount of permissions you've heard least privilege access a lot over the past 18 months. You know, LPA applies here. If if that application did not need S3 list on my buckets and S3 get object, then those permissions could have been you know removed, and maybe this breach wouldn't have actually tra transpired. So, really looking at the at the IAM plane as a way to mitigate this has to be a spot where you start. So Alex, I feel like we just got a dissertation on this, um, but do you have anything else you can yeah, add to that? Yeah, well, I mean, to Chris's first point, th there's so much to talk about. Um, they, they, there's, it's a fascinating case study in, in its uniqueness and complexity. Um, I think for starters, um, you know, even just looking at, you know, more of like the role stuff Chris was talking about, not only did it have the S3 list, the S3 get objects and all of that, but the follow-up is that Capital One's got a policy, they encrypt everything. And so they should have, with just that, they should have been able to only have encrypted data, but that role, in addition to all of that, also had a KMS decrypt permission on that. So I said, oh, this data is secure. Oh, but by the way, if you need it, you can also then you know, unsecure it as well, which seems kind of counterproductive. And again, just kind of doubles down on, on the challenge yet importance of IAM. But I think overall, 
this compared to like the Booz Allen one, you know, this is the exact opposite. This is not the no brainer of, oh, I should have flipped one switch and everything would have been good. There's multiple smaller failures kind of all the way down the chain that really all led together to have this massive breach. And, and at least to, to my knowledge, it's kind of the first of its kind. Um, you know, again, a lot of the, these cloud breaches that we see are, are very binary. Oh yeah, we knew about that. You should have done better. Um, but where we've got a, you know, not just a network breach, not just a, you know, public or not public breach, but multiple things coming together. Um, it's new, it's interesting, it's scary, um, and it was highly visible. Yeah, all right, guys, we have two questions on this. So the first, in your opinions, or from what you've seen, what do you think are the next wave of breaches? The next S3, Elasticsearch, et cetera, and that's from David Mundy, thank you. Let's, uh, let's start with you, Alex. Yeah. The next wave. Next wave. Uh, I think, as, as time goes on and people are getting more, more familiar with how uh, this new cloudy world works, I think we're going to, th I think the next wave is going to be incrementally more complex breaches more frequently. You know, there's no way this is the last cap one as far as a multi kind of tier breach. And, and I think it's kind of a theme. It's going to continue to all come down to IAM. I think networking is and will continue to be important. I think though that IAM will become the, the new threat vector that people are finding new ways to poke holes in environments. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, you know, you will see more more sophisticated attacks. I think there was an article that they just published today on some some IAM related um, attacks, you know, vectors that are, that are out there, um, you know, Elasticsearch continues to be a big one. RDS continues to be a big one. I mean, I think anywhere where, where, where you're more likely to hold large amounts of data about either your company, its employees, classified documents, or you know, personally identifiable in, information, that's where the malicious users want want to target. Um, you know, a, 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 a lot of those it just requires a couple button pushes to make yourself public. So I think like that's that's really where you want to focus are those those areas and those resource types that are most often used to, to house sensitive data and the and, and the ones that are only a click away in the console to basically allow it to be public you know rds and elasticsearch don't have those s3 block public access type of settings and so i think that that's that that's maybe a focus area that you want to you you want to start with and hopefully we see the cloud service providers themselves start to in, introduce the same s3 type of block access at, at the services that I just mentioned. Yeah, agreed. Did we lose Josh? <laughs> Does seem a little stuck. Yes. I'll follow up, I'll follow up then. I think, I, I think what we both just talked about is kind of the next wave. I think, I think there's then a kind of like the next tier of waves that we're that we still haven't seen yet people are talking about which is um oh there's josh um where um you know we haven't seen any any big stuff where like functions have been popped yeah. and and you know people are trying to kind of stay on the cutting edge and then lean more into that and then now new kind of new uh, attack vectors from maybe slightly less adopted technologies kind of open up a whole new world beyond, again, those kind of binary public or not public sort of checks. All right. Yeah, sorry. Um, I forgot to tell my kids to get off Netflix, so I might, <laughs> I might drop one more time. Um, there's another good question around this one. So uh, this is from Orlando Medina. I think that Capital One is not, it's not just AWS fault or Capital One fault. So it's, they're saying it's not either of those faults from, it's from both ends because Capital One should have controls from third-party risk within AWS. What is your, your opinion about third-party risk liability within AWS? And I, I would say extend that to the greater cloud environments as well. That's, a, that's definitely a big, a big question there. And look, um, it's not a blame game here. The security in the cloud is hard. I think if there's anything to take away from this, like this is not, you can, you know, you can put one one poor soul on it and just have them do all of your security management across your entire enterprise. You, you need a, concentrated effort with, you know, very, very sharp, savvy individuals who understand cloud. You need fantastic tooling. You know, you need to be looking at 
behavioral analytics, you, you know, network, you know, identity access management, there's all types of signals that you have to look through and you need tooling that cuts through the noise. I think that, you know, there's no liability necessarily to like pin here, but I think that you need to see uh, both sides of the equation, the customers of cloud and the vendors that actually, you know, go and build these services and sell the services to these customers need to focus a lot more on the shared responsibility model and actually break down the walls. Like all of us have to work on this together. The clouds themselves need to give a lot better tooling to help the customers do this and do it the right way. And I think you're seeing that with every single month we see Google and Azure and Amazon roll out better, more efficient ways to audit security at scale because they're recognizing that everyone's embraced cloud. They're all getting in there and the size and the landscape of their of their footprint probably goes beyond any of our imaginations. I mean, I, I definitely didn't think that I would see customers with 3000 cloud accounts and, you know, three or four different you know providers. This is a very, very complex stuff. So I'm, I'm just excited to see what the uh, f- you know, future brings. All right, I'm going to skip to uh, wrap up here with the, the five minute mark. So from a conclusion standpoint, I believe, um, Chris, I'm going to pass this one to you. Uh, yeah, so I think, look, I, it, sorry, the animations are a little bit delayed there. I, I, I think you have to consider the full stack and you have to think, you know, defense in depth across all, all of these areas here. Um, there's, there's protective measures that you can put in place at all of these layers. Uh, I think you can design your applications and your networking, as Alex, you know, talked about, um, you know, earlier on in this in this presentation, to be be designed with better security, you know, and best practices in mind. And I think automation has got to be key. You know, when 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 you detect suspicious signals, if somebody, you know, attaches a role to an EC2 instance, capture that signal, walk it back to the policies and the and the permission sets that are assigned to that role verify that it doesn't have something like administrator access or I am password or some of these these permissions that we've talked about, like, you know, decrypting of keys, go talk to the developers of those applications and make sure that they need those permissions. And lastly, I think educate. Education has to be key. You have to make sure that you are continuing to push, uh, you know, information about these known attack vectors to all of your stakeholders that, that consume cloud. So they're aware of the consequence of when they when they deploy this stuff and hopefully they deploy it the right way. Great, Alex, anything to add? To that? Uh, I'll double down on the uh, the automate. Uh, there's an inflection point in every environment where throwing man hours at the problem doesn't make sense anymore. And if you really wanna keep on kind of staying on top of things, even as complexity exponentially increases, you have to automate. All right, we have we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, the first, I'm going to summarize a little bit. It's from from Jackie. Out of the kind of through your experience, the most mature organization in securing their cloud environment, where they planned or developed or deployed or in their run state, what are they doing different than the others? So, from your experience, the most mature organization, what are they doing different, and why are they there? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with you know building that cloud center of excellence, building up the knowledge, and you know the. The, you know, sharing the responsibility across multiple business units. You're all kind of working together, um, educating the developers down downstream, you know, CICD, being able to shift left with your security analysis, pre-flight checks before this is deployed. There's a number of different things. I think that what, what they all have in common is they, they've embraced this as we need to invest a lot of dollars into the security of our cloud. You know, like cloud is supposed to be this cheaper way to run things. And in some scenarios it is. I think you are saving a lot of dollars in areas you used to have to spend in traditional data center days, but you have to reallocate some of those dollars that you're saving and, and, and really invest year after year into the security of your cloud because the cost of a mishap oftentimes will far outweigh the investment dollars you have to make in building a team to sort of have that concentrated effort. Nothing Alex? to add. Great answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so too. All right, guys, we are at time. Thank you so much. Uh, truly appreciate the input, Alex and Chris. And uh, I think coming up next is going to be Thomas Martin going through closing remarks as well as into the raffle. So with that, welcome, Thomas. Excellent.